everyone wants to boost their leptin because they want to boost up their metabolism. I get it, but the reality is that we're running into more of a leptin resistance issue. We have too much leptin that isn't getting received. There's two sides to the equation. There's producing leptin, and then there's actually receiving the leptin to do something with it. We generally have an issue with receiving the leptin. Let's break it down. So leptin is a hormone that's secreted by our fat. Okay, It's a signaling molecule. So we have to remember that our fat secretes leptin, it travels to the hypothalamus, and it sends a signal for the brain to regulate our metabolism in such a way. The more fat that we have on hand, the more leptin we produce, the more signal our brain receives, and it revs up the metabolism because the brain can say, yes, we have enough fat on hand, we are good to rev up the metabolism. If we're not producing leptin because like, maybe we're starving, then the brain would say, we got to slow down the metabolism. We are running into an issue that we have so much leptin being produced by way of leptin producing foods, but also just a lot of fat on us in the first place, that our brain is bombarded with a signal to the point where it loses its leptin receiving capabilities. It becomes leptin resistant. So no matter how much leptin we produce, the brain is just like not picking up the phone. Therefore, our metabolism stays at a halt as if we weren't producing leptin at all, even though we are producing it. In fact, we're producing more and more and more and more to try to get a signal. It's like someone calling you off the hook and the more that you don't pick up, the more that they call you and call you and call you and hope that you pick up, but you don't pick up the phone because now you've annoyed them even more to the point where they don't pick up the phone at all. That's what's happening. So what are the five causes of leptin resistance that are very common? Let's talk about them. The first one is usually associated with overeating, even in shorter stints. Okay, we look at leptin, we say, okay, you have to become obese to get leptin resistant. Well, no, not necessarily. Okay, overeating, even in relatively acute forms, can trigger leptin resistance. Here's how that works. There are studies that have demonstrated that diet-induced obesity, meaning like if you're just forcing a bunch of calories over a shorter period of time, like for a couple of weeks or even a few weeks, it can trigger a 22% reduction in leptin receptor expression in the brain, meaning the genes in your brain are not producing enough receptors for leptin. On the other side of the equation, caloric restriction can trigger a 43% increase in the expression of leptin receptors. So it can happen relatively quick. The point in this isn't to say don't ever overeat, but the point is in saying that even short-term overeating can trigger this lack of expression of leptin receptors. So you are much better off to really control your portions with that. So that's why you find that people that, I don't know, maybe they eat light breakfast and light lunch, and then they overeat with dinner, well, to scale, that is a caloric surplus at that very point in time that is causing an issue. And that can absolutely trigger more leptin resistance. Now, the problem is, is as fat cells get bigger, they don't linearly produce more leptin, they exponentially produce more leptin. So for example, if you had a person that had, let's just make it simple, five really big fat cells, they're gonna produce X amount of leptin. If someone has 10 really big fat cells, they're not gonna produce twice as much leptin. They're gonna produce an exponential amount more leptin because it's not linear. Your body doesn't produce leptin in a linear fashion. So once you develop more fat cells or bigger fat cells, more leptin and more leptin and more leptin and less overall just receiving of the signal. What happens is overeating disrupts what is called the STAT Three signal. The STAT3 signal is what allows leptin to get into the cell and sends a signal inside the cell to the nucleus to allow the DNA to program properly to well, receive the signal. Bottom line is you need to have periods of caloric restriction to be able to allow the gene expression to occur to accept that leptin signaling. So yes, periodic fasting or periodic caloric restriction that is in some eyes relatively extreme can actually work very well. Which leads me to the next one, which is inflammation. Yes, being overweight, yes, having fat cells that are extremely large can trigger an inflammatory response, but there's also a lot of lifestyle factors. Okay, sleep deprivation, over-exercising, stress, all these things are inflammatory signals. 
And I want you to think of inflammation as like static that is occurring in your body. Okay, static is going to make it so that signal that is being sent from the fat, no matter how much you have, is getting lost in the way. And then it ends up just never actually hitting the brain because it's not able to cross through the blood brain barrier right. Okay, if it can't cross through the blood brain barrier because there's a bunch of static, how is it ever going to enter the brain to send the proper signal? Studies have found that even short term hypercaloric loads, like where you add a bunch of calories for a short amount of time, can trigger so much in the way of hypothalamic inflammation. That means inflammation that is localized in the brain, specifically in the hypothalamus region, which is exactly where the leptin needs to travel to. So you can see how we run into an issue there. So how do we modulate inflammation? Well, there's a lot of different ways that you can look at that. Okay, one of the ways that is very good for modulating inflammation is of course intermittent fasting or doing some kind of ketogenic protocol that increases beta hydroxybutyrate which can blunt some of those ketones, but maybe that's not for you. Maybe you have to look at other ways. Okay? Well, there's other things. Exercise obviously, getting more sleep. But some of these lifestyle factors are a little bit hard to I don't know, implement or even indoctrinate into your life. You just have to be paying attention with that. If you're doing keto, by the way, something that I recommend, there is a product down below called Perfect Keto. They are a sponsor of this channel. They are awesome. But I just wanted to mention them because one of the things that I would recommend if you're doing any kind of like caloric deficit thing to try to like help the situation out is going to be utilizing something like collagen. So the collagen that is linked down below, you can get a special discount on if you use that link. That's going to save you a couple bucks if you use the code that's listed down below. So Perfect Keto has been a sponsor of this channel for years. They are awesome even if you're not doing keto. So highly recommend you check them out using that link down below. The next cause of leptin resistance is going to be a lack of consistent exercise. Okay, when you have consistent exercise, you start sending these inflammatory signals and some of them are anti-inflammatory signals. So exercise triggers inflammation, but it's the acclimation to that inflammation that allows us to deal with it. When we exercise, we have an increase in what is called interleukin-6, which is kind of a localized inflammation. But it turns out that this inflammation that occurs within the body seems to have a different effect in the brain. Interleukin-6 can actually affect our inflammatory signaling at the brain level, making it so that the central nervous system is a little bit more receptive to leptin. Additionally, the interleukin-6 that gets increased as a result of regular exercise causes a subsequent increase in interleukin-10, and this interleukin-10 is a general anti-inflammatory interleukin, where it has an effect on what's called I know all these gobbledygook terms, right? Nuclear factor kappa B. Long story short, we downregulate systemic inflammation by having periodic spikes in different kinds of inflammation via exercise. This has a huge, huge, huge role on how much of the overall leptin can get through the blood brain barrier and into our hypothalamus and do our job, right? Rev up the metabolism. The next one is very interesting it's temporarily increasing your protein. The American Journal of Clinical Nutrition published something really interesting. They found that if you took people that were normally eating 15% of their diet and protein and doubled their protein intake to 30% and kept their carbohydrates the same, they had a significant reduction in caloric intake that resulted in, well, generally some weight loss, but better yet, better leptin signaling and better leptin receiving at the central nervous system level. In other words, it increased the energy expenditure in such a way that the central nervous system responded by becoming more leptin sensitive. Remember, what we are after is becoming sensitive to leptin. We don't need more leptin, but we need better leptin signaling and less leptin being able to get the job done. It's a lot better to do more with less than it is to try to cram more leptin to boost up the metabolism. We don't generally need more leptin. The only situation in which you would need more leptin is if you've been dieting for a very long time and your metabolism is crushed and then you have to increase it that way. You have to try to actually add food to get a leptin response. So by increasing your protein intake, you increase the thermic effect because protein intake in general is going to rev up your metabolism because 20% of the calories that are in protein are allocated just towards the metabolization and utilization of protein in the first place. It takes a lot of energy to metabolize protein. So sometimes that increased energy expenditure that's associated with it is going to allow us to have that little bit of an epinephrine response that therefore allows our central nervous system to start processing leptin better. Okay, so again, when you get to a point where you're just 
just loading up on carbs and loading up on fat and not getting enough protein, well then you run into a leptin issue. And lastly, the big one, although it's not the sexiest one in the world, is going to be sleep. And this has to do with cortisol. Okay, if we are consistently getting poor sleep, we have an increase in glucocorticoids like cortisol. This increase in what's called the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis and this increase in cortisol is going to skew and kind of mess up our insulin response a little bit, which has not only an effect on inflammation, but also has an effect on how much we eat. Okay, cortisol and insulin work together. And when cortisol levels are elevated, we have a tendency to eat. We have a tendency to overeat. So when you have these periodic spikes in cortisol, these periodic spikes of hypercaloric intake, well, then you're going to have, once again, we come back to square one, that impaired leptin signaling, that impaired leptin receptor effect. So then we're not able to receive that leptin as well. So just to recap here, okay, try to keep your caloric intake at given meals at a respectful level. Okay, do not have these huge, huge spikes of huge surpluses. This is why I'm not a big fan of doing like one meal a day type eating because you just have these big spikes that can trigger all these signals. Okay, two is going to be modulating inflammation whichever ways you possibly can. Stress, lifestyle, whatever. Look into anti-inflammatory protocols, anti-inflammatory foods because it's very, very important. Okay, number three is going to be consistent exercise even if it is not super difficult. Consistently keeping it going so your body develops these anti-inflammatory patterns pathways and gets it going in a rhythm. Okay, number four, increase your protein. Get that protein level up. Even if it's temporary, double your protein and reduce calories somewhere else. It will make a huge difference with satiety and the thermic effect. And lastly, do what you can to get better sleep quality. Don't worry about quantity, worry more about quality. Take hot showers before you go to bed so your body has a chance to cool down and it triggers that response. Try taking things like glycine. Try utilizing collagen, which is super rich in glycine because it plays a big role in how your body can help regulate and thermoregulate and put you in that sleep state. We have to tackle leptin resistance before we can ever look at boosting our metabolism again. As always, keep it locked in here on my channel and I'll see you tomorrow.